Hi everybody and welcome back to my channel. So following our chemistry video today, I am going to be doing a very similar video and it is just about how we're going to get a 2020 2020 a 20 out of 20 on our biology IA2. So the bio one is a little bit tricky because you can either do it on like biodiversity with like plants and all that or you can do it. I know some schools may do it with population and all that. I know a lot do biodiversity and that is what mine was on. So this here is my um assignment. I got a 20 out of 20 on it last year and yeah I'm going to take you through it. I have an ISMG for biology on the side here. The only thing with this one though is it's got like this highlighting on it and that's because it was from the exemplar but I don't want you to worry about that highlighting because it's not applicable to mine. This is just the only um, ISMG I could find. So the first thing I'm going to do is take you through the easiest two marks that you were going to get. I literally do not want any of you going home without these two marks. And these two marks are essentially your communication marks. So I don't want to, you know, get anyone down if they've not got these two marks before, but these are the easiest marks ever. Like to get them, you basically have to do very little work. The first point here that you have to, um, sort of match is your fluent and concise use of scientific language and representations. So basically that means write it maturely, write it professionally and use biology words. So when we're talking about quadrats, so the quadrats are the squares that you chuck down and count stuff in, you would call them quadrats, you wouldn't call them squares, you know? So make sure you just use the words that your biology teacher uses. Make sure you're using those you know, those scientific words. The next one is appropriate use of genre conventions. So this is basically like, how do we write a lab report? So as I go through, the, through this, we've got like our title, then we have our rationale and we've got titles for each one. Then we keep moving through and you'll see all the headings as we go through. But that also includes things like our figure headings, our table headings, so like here whether we put units if necessary. So units isn't necessary in this case here, but in a lot of assignments, units are necessary. What else can we include? Oh, when we have a graph, we need to include um, a legend here. So I've got disturbed and undisturbed. We need a title. We need, um, you know, our X and Y axis to be labeled with what they are, if that's necessary. Now, something I've just noticed here that I need to point out, if you look at what I've done here, I've got like a graph in the middle of words and that's because originally I did this on Google Docs and then when I downloaded it for this video, it like messed it all up. So do not hand in your assignment if it looks like this. If you've got like a graph in the middle of your words or say you've got your title just touching the graph there, like that is not good. You will lose communication marks for that. Mine only looks like that because of some weird mistake made when I downloaded it. So that is actually the perfect example of what not to do. That's the sort of thing that's going to get you bumped down a mark. Now the last thing we need to look at for these two marks is the acknowledgement of sources of information through appropriate use of referencing conventions. So you need to reference and QCAA does not specify a referencing style. Basically it is whatever your school's policy is but typically it's Harvard or APA. Now my school did APA 7 so that is just what I did. All of my referencing is APA 7 and that includes first of all your in-text references so make sure you have those. If you have a figure, so I have a map of the park here, I also reference that. And then at the very end, you need to have, and again, this is an example of bad um, formatting because of the download, you need to have your reference list and that one must be in alphabetical order. So those are sort of the sorts of things that we're looking for for referencing. And then if you want to, you can also include your original method in an appendix where it doesn't count towards the word count. Now, the last thing that sort of counts, counts, that sort of goes towards our um, communication marks is the word limit. And your word limit is 2000 words. You cannot go over that. And you know that you're writing a good assignment when you struggle and you need to cut down. All of my assignments would always, like when I finished writing them, be a thousand words over. And then I would have to work and work and work to cut down on that. And that's how you know that you're making a good and refined assignment. You should be hitting that 2000. If you're not getting close, then you definitely have more work to do. But those are the easy two marks that we want to be looking at. 
Now I'm going to take you through the rest of these points. So this first one up here, honestly, I can't remember what the different boxes are for, but let's have a look. So we have informed application of blah, 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 demonstrated by the first thing says a considered rationale for the experiment. So this is my rationale up here. And what we need to do is we first need to give a really brief overview of like what the main sort of thing is. So mine is all about biodiversity because that is part of my thing. And also you're probably looking at my title going, that is the worst title ever, it's five words. No, that's the sort of thing that your title needs to be like. I remember my biology teacher telling us that in the scientific community, they actually try really hard to get any journal article title below 10 words. And it has to be a really good summary. So that was sort of a little exercise she made us do. Then I also talk about edge effect down there because those are my variables. I'm looking at plant biodiversity and I'm seeing how edge effect affects plant biodiversity. I then talk about the actual location. So I did mine in Duggan Park um, in Toowoomba. So that is where we actually did our um, experiment. And the good thing is often you can find like a map of the park or something. And because I was looking at edge effect, so I was looking like in the middle of the park where there's no human disruption and then along the trails it was really good because i could say the trail we used was the sensory walk so it's really really good to have maps on there i then talked a little bit about um the methods i use so i use quadrats and i use two different identification things to identify which plants I then talk a little bit about the original experiment and the original experiment was at a different location. We did it at Iron Gate Conservation Park. So I mentioned that. I mentioned um, the three different methods we use to do that. And then I also talked about the actual results. So a quick little sentence on the SDIs of both of them. I then talked a tad bit about the limitations because I then use those limitations in my modification. So it was really nice and well connected. I then, a lot of teachers like you to include your variables. And this is like a really nice summary of what you actually did. And in biology experiments, it can be so confusing to figure out what you actually did. So this variables part is very important. So the first thing is, what's the independent location? independent. The independent variable is the location. So mine was at Duggan Park. I then talked about what I did with this location. So I used stratified sampling, which split my surveyed area into two different strata, next to the walking trail and away from the walking trail. I then specified that that was the disturbed and undisturbed location, because that is what I'm going to be referring to them throughout this assignment. So if you are going to shorten a name of something to something else, make sure you put that somewhere in your rationale because your rationale should be all of the new information. I then spoke about my dependent variables, which were the things I was measuring and I was re measuring richness, evenness and biodiversity. I then spoke about the controlled variables, which were my sampling methods and counting criteria. And counting criteria is incredibly important for biology and it's so important that you control it. So I would really recommend including that if you're doing any assignment like this and to control it basically you just have one person do all the counting. There is one thing though that I think is worth mentioning and that is what you cannot control that may have an effect on it. So weather and time of day couldn't be controlled. I couldn't do anything about that and then I said don't worry about it this shouldn't affect our plant numbers. If you were looking at animals then you would need to say that might be an issue but just because the sun goes down or the sun comes up, that doesn't change plants. Plants are sedentary, so I didn't have a problem there. You then need to have a really brief statement, one sentence on why it's important, like why your experiment is important. And I basically just said, and this is straight out of one of the QCAA um, web, like dot points, we need to monitor um, ecological regions so we can manage them properly. And that's why I did this experiment. Then the last part is, what is your research question? And your research question should be as specific as possible. And there is a bit of a dot point about that. So that is my considered rationale, but let's have a look at our research question. It should be a specific and relevant research question. So let's look through mine. First of all, I mentioned, is it a statistically significant difference? That is super important in biology. If you don't know what statistically significant is, ask your teacher. I then specify that I'm talking about plant biodiversity. If I just said biodiversity, then 
that includes animals too. So I needed to include plant biodiversity. And the reason I didn't say plant numbers is because of that communication mark about the fluent and concise use of scientific language. Why say plant numbers when I could say plant biodiversity? Then I talk about my um, variables um, affected by edge effect and not affected by edge effect. And then I talked about how am I going to measure this? Simpson's diversity index, species richness, and species evenness. So for biology, this is the format I really recommend. Difference. So basically, is there a difference? And then what is our dependent variable? So in this case, plant biodiversity. Then what is our independent variable? In this case, case um, the areas I picked, so edge effect and not edge effect. And then how are we going to measure that? So that is a little bit different to um, chemistry and physics, but that is honestly a really solid way to go about it in biology. So that is our research question ticked. Now, this one here, a methodology that enables the collection of sufficient relevant data, that is basically have a good experiment. Don't have a silly one where... You're talking about waterways and then you do it at a location that doesn't have a waterway. That is a bad experiment. Most experiments are pretty good. Now, we need to talk about risks and modifications. So our modifications must be justified. How do we justify our modifications here? What we want to do is we want to put it in a table with three columns exactly like that. We have the nature. So if you don't know, modifications can be a refinement, a redirection or an extension. Extensions don't do them. We want to be doing our refinements and our redirections. So, you know, those are our um, nature there. Nature just means what kind of modification is it? Then we're going to put what the actual modification is. So one of my refinements were instead of using three different surveying techniques, I decided to put five quadrats down. Then I needed to justify that. And this is my justification. One trial with three different techniques is not reliable at all. So then I decided to use one technique for consistent data collection and then use five trials per area to increase that reliability. So I've done that for each one. And it's really important that you really signpost this justification column because if you don't, most people forget to actually justify it. And the um, ISMG does say, justified. You must justify it to get anywhere. The last one is a considered management of risks and ethical or environmental issues. And this one, a lot of people miss. So there's a word and here, which means you ha must have at least one risk and at least one ethical or environmental issue. This here says, or you don't need both an ethical and an environmental. You just need one or the other, but that and means that you must have one of them. So let's have a look at what I put down here. What I do for my risk assessment is I put risk in one column and then the management in another because you need to show what you did about it. So my um, risks were I had injury caused by flora slash fauna because you can't say you could get a snake bite, you could get a spider bite, you could get a this, this, this. In biology, in the field, there are so many different things that could go wrong and I categorise them two ways. Injury by living things, so in this case I said flora and fauna, and I gave an example, stings or allergic reactions, and then I said injury called, caused by non-living things, so I said terrain, such as rolling your ankle in an unstable land or getting sunburnt. Then my management was having the field group equipped with first aid, we moved with caution, we wore long pants, hats and shirts, and we made sure we wore our sunscreen and our insect spray. It doesn't have to be anything amazing, it just needs to be, what did you do to keep safe? So that those are there are my risks. Here is my environmental or ethical issue. So my environmental issue was destruction. So trampling, flora, littering. So anything that we could do to hurt the environment. And basically my management was just, we were cautious when we were moving. So we didn't crush anything. And we avoided leaving anything that was not originally there. So everything we took to the park, we took home. So that is my risk assessment. And if you guys do those things, you are going to get six marks in this first section. Now let's move on to a little bit meatier stuff. So let's have a look here. Appropriate application of algorithms, visual and graphical representations of data about blah, demonstrated by correct and relevant processing of data. So what we need here is two things. We need a graph and we need process data. 
that is what you need here. You must have both of them. So let's have a look at my thing. So here, the first thing that you need to do is you need to put down your raw data. So my raw data here was how many of each species were in each quadrat. Right now, that's a whole lot of numbers in a table. It doesn't mean anything. So I needed to do something about it. So those are my two locations. And then I also have my number of species. So what you need to do is you need to put all of those in and then say, um, a little bit of stuff about them. So just general observations. Here you should also include your quantitative quantitative qualitative um observations. So I just spoke a little bit about what Duggan Park is like. So I said it was pretty similar the whole way. Like there wasn't one part that had like a massive lake. The only thing was um, a steep downward slope on one side. So I talk a little bit about the um, straight up raw data. You must say something about it. Then this is my sample calculations. So again, you can see here that there's some poor formatting just from like changing um, from like Google Docs to whatever I'm on now. And what we need to do here is we need our sample calculations. So any calculation you do, and you must do them on Excel, any calculation you do, you need to put in a sample. So what I did was I picked one quadrat in the disturbed location and I did a sample SDI. So what I did was I put in all of the data here and then I included the actual calculation in here and showed the number. I did the same for the Shannon Wiener index and the same for, I can never say this, Menhynix index. So I did all of that for both of them. And that is sort of um what the sample calculations are. So that is showing you process the data. But what you need to do is then put all of the data actually in tables. So it's all laid out quite nicely. So I've got the SDI in each location. And then I have the... Oh, yep, I found I did the data summary on Excel, which is incredibly important that you do. So I did the data summary on Excel and I only chose the important values out of that. So the mean standard error and standard deviation. And then I have the table of my t-test and then I've got my graph. So this is my graph of the STI. So that is my visual data and graphical data. And then here I've got the tables holding my Shannon Wiener and Hynix index. So it's really, really important that you show your sample calculations, tables, and at least one graph. Now, biology, it's hard to make graphs. A lot of the time, what you're doing isn't relevant, but you need at least one. Now, you need to also, in your appendix, put your full, um, processing. So I put the full data summaries in. So remember how I said I only used mean standard error and standard deviation. Well, when you do those calculations, you actually also get median, mode, variance, kurtosis, skewness, range, minimum, maximum, sum, count. You also get all of that sort of stuff. And obviously I didn't include it because it's not relevant. You don't want to include stuff that's not relevant, but you need to show that you did your data summary and you need to show all of the stuff that came along with it. And that goes in the appendix. So that is how we sort of show that we um, have like processed our data and we've done it correctly and we've done it visually and all that so what do we do from here now the last dot point here is literally saying you collected sufficient and relevant raw data and that one and the metho methodology one comes like hand in hand because you can't have one without the other. So that last dot point there is a really easy one to get. Honestly, it's just you collected data that you could do stuff with. But what I do want to point out here is that it says relevant raw data, which means it does want you to show your raw data somewhere in there. But let's have a look at this trickier dot point here. Systematic and effective analysis about them through thorough identification of relevant trends, patterns, or relationships. So thoroughly means even if there's not something important there, note that down. So in my raw data, I think... Oh, also, I forgot to say, you should say what you did in your process data before you list it. So I said, Excel was used for all calculations. The data analysis pack was used. So I really suggest you say that. Now, where is something that I am looking at here? I'm trying to find it. I remember it's in here. Here. So this is an example of thoroughly identifying trends and patterns. So most people think, oh, just analyze a graph, analyze whatever. You also need to analyze your raw data. So I said something that was really interesting was in the disturbed location, this specific species was present in four out of the five quadrats and 
like significantly. And then I said it actually wasn't present at all in the undisturbed locations. So that's actually an interesting point to make. Yes, it didn't have a big effect on my assignment, but that's showing that I've thought about the data I've collected. To even further show that I've actually thought about it, I said, the fact that it was present massive times, like massively compared to other species, it would have quite significantly affected the mean Simpsons diversity index because of the really disproportionate numbers here. So that is the sort of thing they're looking for, not just the basic identifying trends on the graph. Yes, you should still do that, but you really need to look a little bit further. The other thing I said was, in quadrant, quadrat three, I noticed that there were seven species and all of which had one individual. But then I also noticed that in that quadrat, it was absolutely covered with thick dead brown leaves. No other quadrats were. And it was the only one that had like a bunch of species, but only one of each. So I was like, oh, well, that might be interesting. And then I did a little bit of Googling and saw if there was a possibly a reason for it. And the reason I found that was it could be attributed to a thick layer of leaves preventing the saplings from accessing air and sunlight. So only a few species grew. So those are the sorts of things that we need to be looking there to sort of figure out that insightful thing. The other sort of part of insightful is figuring out if it's statistically significant because of the p-value. And the other thing you need to look at are the error bars overlapping. In this case, the error bars are overlapping, which means that we can't, like, it's not statistically significant. So that is something super duper important to look at. And that's sort of how you identify everything that is going on there. The other thing is thorough and appropriate identification of uncertainty and the limitations of evidence. So throughout here, I do mention a couple of things like the dead leaves, the lots and lots of this Stephania japonica. So I did note that sort of stuff. I also noted the error bar, which does come into the uncertainty. And I also spoke about, where is it? Up here, I did talk a bit about error and deviation. But the really important thing is actually our limitations. And what I do is I put them down with improvements and extensions, just because it makes a really nice link and saves a lot of words. Because the ISMG actually does say your improvements and extensions must be related to your limitations. So now let's go down and look at that last dot point down here. Suggestive, suggested improvements and extensions to the experiment that are logically derived from the analysis of evidence. So that basically means when you identify those limitations, you should have made improvements and extensions based upon them. So this is what I've done. So I figured out, okay, we had limited time to complete the field work. And then I said it lowered reliability because we could, if we had more time, we could have done more quadrats and more locations. So that was my effect on the experiment. And we should be putting it in a table like this with limitation, effect, and then what the improvement or extension is. So I said we had limited time. This lowered the reliability because we could have done more trials if we didn't. And then my improvement was increase the time allocated. Cool. Then for extensions, I said limited to Duggan Park. Then I said this does not consider all locations or all types of edge effect because in my experiment, I was looking at edge effect on a walking trail, whereas we could also look at edge effect on places like highways. So that was my extension, going further than Duggan Park, going further. Extensions are about going in further. Improvements are about making the experiment you already did better. So those are our improvements, extensions, and limitations. Now, the next one is justified conclusions linking to the research question. So when you get down to your conclusion here, where is it? Do, 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 do. Basically, I always open with to answer the research question and then you directly answer it and then you need to justify it. So to justify it, you basically have to restate everything you've already said. What were the SDIs? What was the data? What was the statistically significant difference? All of that sort of stuff. If you can, bring in some theoretical values. Now, I was very lucky that I could actually find theoretical values. A lot of you won't be able to, and that's completely okay. But if you can, bring in the theory. So to justify it, answer the question, give some data, and then bring in some outside theory. Maybe say, why was this so you could say that because it was 
higher SDI without edge effect, then you would find a source that would explain why that is the case. Then we would go down to reliability and validity, and this is our last point here, and this is also a justified. So I was talking about standard error and standard deviation, and then a little bit about my actual experiment. So one of them I was talking about, yes, it was spatially representative, but my experiment was not temporally representative, so I didn't do it over time. So that did lower a bit of the reliability of my experiment. The other thing was I said at times my the application I used could have, could have incorrectly identified the species and I wouldn't have known, but we did have low uncertainty. I did say that the limitations I spoke about lowered the validity of the experiment because they restricted the research question from being fully answered. Yes, it given the available time, it was good and the method was thorough, but I could have done more. So I did say it was not as valid as it could have been, but overall my experiment was pretty good. And that is sort of everything I have to tell you. So if you guys can follow that, you, you can get a 20 out of 20. It's not a guaranteed, but if you can do that to the best of your ability, you are in a very, very good place. Please let me know if you have any questions and I hope you found this video useful. And yeah, thank you for watching.